started uh, since I think we have everyone on the line that we need. Um, so I just wanted to start off by saying um, thanks to everybody for joining us today. Um, we'll begin our event with some opening remarks related to the public service announcement that was issued this afternoon that you should all have. Following that, we can take some questions from our news media. Now, joining us to take your questions, we have our CEO, Scott Livingstone, Dr. Susan Shaw, our Chief Medical Officer, and also Derek Miller, the Site Commander of our Emergency Operations Centre. I just wanna go through some housekeeping notes before we begin. Uh, during the media Q&A, if you have a question, please click the hand icon by your name. You'll be called on when it's your turn. Your line will be unmuted and you'll get one question as well as one follow-up question. Now, alternatively, you can ask your question in the chat box, just type it in there and it will be read aloud on your behalf when it's time. Now, in order to make sure that we're allowing our leaders to get back to their urgent work related to pandemic response, we're going to do our best to cap the question and answer portion to about 20 minutes, and we thank you for your support in that. With that said, let's begin with our opening remarks from our CEO, Scott Livingstone, whenever you're ready. Thanks, Amanda. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to start by acknowledging the many families in Saskatchewan that have been tragically impacted by COVID. Today, there are seven new deaths reported, and as you know, more than 600 in Saskatchewan during the course of the pandemic so far. I'm sincerely sorry to all those families and friends affected by COVID-19 who have experienced this kind of loss, and for all of those suffering and battling COVID today in our hospitals and ICUs. This should underline our resolve to continue to fight this disease. I also want to take the opportunity to thank healthcare workers across this province who are facing unprecedented pressures, and they have stepped up again to provide care and save lives under exceptionally difficult circumstances. We all owe them our sincerest thanks. I'd also like to thank Susan Shaw and Derek Miller for taking time out of their busy schedules to support the news conference. I wish we had better news, but today, as a result of rapidly escalating COVID pressures on Saskatchewan's hospitals, the SHA Emergency Operations Centre has directed our teams to activate the second phase of surge plans. Effective immediately, all teams are required to identify and activate without delay slowdowns that will enable the deployment of staff to assist with high priority COVID services in ICU and acute care services within our hospitals and across the system. We're also using this process to support the deployment of staff to our testing and immunization areas. This will mean a reduction of inpatient surgeries and SHA elective procedures performed in inpatient and outpatient areas, including pediatrics, in order to create staff capacity to support COVID care. Together, we must move now to build provincial capacity for the growing surge ahead of us. We wanna be clear that if people have an emergency or need critical care, they should still present at our hospitals. While the pressures are significant on our healthcare system, we do not wanna see people deferring necessary emergency services. We're also maintaining mental health and addiction services across the province to ensure people get the services they need during these challenging times. Today's directive asks our teams to focus on COVID care in our hospitals while continuing to support emergency and cancer procedures and treatments and cases deemed urgent in the next six weeks. We've hit a critical point and we are now on the verge of the largest test of our healthcare system since the beginning of the pandemic. Teams are being asked to support the healthcare system's ability to maintain services for those at greatest risk while ensuring the SHA can support vaccine delivery as well as testing and contact tracing to help slow the spread of COVID-19. With the support of the province's emergency order from earlier this week, staff will be redeployed to areas that have been facing urgent and emergent care demands. It is our hope that this will provide immediate relief and help to escalate capacity to meet rapidly surging caseloads. Implementation of this will be occurring over the coming days with most of the impact to patients beginning next week. The pressure on our hospitals is a direct result of the ongoing pandemic of the unvaccinated. The result is that many Saskatchewan residents will now go without everyday healthcare services they need to preserve their quality of life. The danger we face is that this will escalate to the point where many Saskatchewan residents won't be able to reliably access critical care or emergency services. That point is not far off. In fact, we already know that our emergency rooms and ICUs are operating over capacity. So please, if you are eligible, get vaccinated. To do otherwise is to make a choice for all Saskatchewan residents about whether emergency and critical services they rely on will be there for them when they need them. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions and I'll turn it over to Amanda. Thanks so much, Scott. 
Uh, we'll go to the media question and answer portion. Um, Linnell, do we have anyone with questions on the line? Uh, no hands up as of yet, but just a reminder to hit the uh, hand icon in uh, the bottom corner there and I will be able to come to you. Okay, uh, Amanda, we have our first question and it's from Nikki Jurek with the Canadian Press. Go ahead, Nikki. Um, yeah, I noticed in the press release that it had mentioned um, that you're building capacity for 125 um, beds for COVID patients, ICU beds for COVID patients. Does that mean that you're projecting there's going to be 125 uh, people with COVID-19 in the ICUs? And, and when, when is that projection expected to take place? So I'll start with that answer and then I can turn it over to Derek if he has anything to add. So as you know, throughout the pandemic, we have used um, modeling and, and real life experience with case numbers to predict what our planning needs to look like to support care of COVID patients and non-COVID patients across the system. So those numbers that were issued today in the press release with the targets for 125 uh, for ICU bed capacity are the targets we believe we will need to appropriately care for the number of cases that we will see in the upcoming weeks. Uh, I can't give you an exact um, number of days or even weeks on when that may occur, but we do know um, because the way the pandemic works that we're always two weeks behind with infected cases. So the cases we're seeing today were infected a couple of weeks ago. The cases we'll we see in two weeks are cases that we're seeing today because hospitalizations, as you know, and IC admissions are, are lagging measures. But we also know that those two things, both hospitalizations and ICU beds uh, or admissions follow um, the, the same type of graph that, that total cases look like. And as you know, we're not at the peak yet. Uh, we're not sure when the peak will occur, but we do see the cases coming um, down the road over the next two to four weeks. And we're trying to prepare to ensure that we have capacity to care for as many people as we can. Derek, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, thanks, Scott. I would just emphasize the uh, the rate of increase in our ICU census right now. It's uh, it's increasing at a rate six times faster than what we saw at a previous um, wave in in wave three, where we had our peak of of ICU demand. And so this uh, this step up in our capacity is really meant to try to be prepared for what well one respond to what we're seeing on our doorsteps right now in the moment, but then also be prepared for what may come in the weeks ahead. Um, and certainly we'll, it will stretch our, our capacities uh, to the limit and, uh, and beyond. So um, these are targets for our teams to plan towards and to try to mobilize our teams to meet. Thanks, Derek. Mickey, did you have another question? I do, yeah. Um, there was a mention of redeploying staff and, and physicians kind of in like, you know, simple terms that maybe like a sixth grader would understand um you know what does that mean does that mean that their family doctor is going to get pulled to come help deal with the surge is it their dentist is it who are these people that are actually getting moved around to help with um the surge that we're seeing in our hospitals so at the, so at this point in time we're are talking specifically about sha resources that are currently working within the system and uh, as an example within the acute care in ICU, we're, we're trying to mobilize as many skilled resources that have been trained or have past experience in ICU or have been upskilled through the pandemic to be able to deal with uh, severe air, airway distress and critical care patients. That does just to remind you that we do have a number of physicians across the province who work with us uh, that have been also received upskill training throughout the pandemic. So there may be the deployment of uh, physicians uh, across the province to help support this work. Uh, so it's, but it is targeted to those individuals that work today within the SHA and with us, whether they're family physicians, primary care providers in rural Saskatchewan that provide services today in hospital long-term care facilities and have private offices, those individuals uh, will also be asked to help out. But specifically from a deployment perspective, it's skilled resources within the SHA to cover uh, those urgent needed positions, particularly nursing, um, uh, as well as uh, skilled physician positions to uh, care for patients as they come in. Derek, did you have anything to add or Susan? Okay, thanks for that, Scott, and thanks, Mickey, for the question. Um, Linnell, who do we have next? Um, if you're Tina Monteleone. Tina, go ahead. 
Hi, thank you. It's Tina from PA now in Prince Albert. I was hoping that somebody could speak specifically about the Victoria Hospital here in PA um, about the the system pressures and and I heard that Prince Albert is on bypass and I'm just wondering what that means. If somebody could provide us an update for PA. Susan, do you want to take that one? Yes, I can. So, uh, Prince Albert Victoria has continued to be uh, very busy, primarily due to the increased numbers of people with COVID infections in our northeast and northwest parts of the province. Um, the critical care unit in Prince Albert Victoria has been on bypass off and on over the past few days, just like many other of our intensive care units, particularly in the north half of the province, but also in places such as Yorkton. They are not currently in a bypass mode right now, but that could change depending on where the next patient is and who needs care. What bypass means is a planned approach to making sure that all patients that need ICU services are managed in a way that balances the um, loads of patients in particular units across the province. Saskatoon right now is on bypass. What this means is that any person who presents uh, needing ICU care who isn't in Saskatoon, um, we'll, we will first look to see can they safely get care elsewhere, and if so, we work with our air ambulance, our stars, and our ground crews to get them safely to the best place so that uh, most people can get care. And do you know um, how far away some patients have had to go who have needed to be bypassed? Like, are, are they heading to Edmonton? Where, I guess, how many and where are they going? I don't have exact numbers at this point. I think the last time we had an update last Friday, there were a total of seven patients in that week who had been diverted using a bypass procedure. Uh, no patients have been sent out of province at this point. Uh, we've been looking after all of our own in hospitals across Saskatchewan, but uh, I do know that sometimes the, the places that have been receiving and helping out are places like uh, Yorkton, Swift Current, Moose Jaw and Regina. And uh, we're very grateful that we have a coordinated response across all Saskatchewan ICUs, really working as a team together. Thank you, Dr. Shaw, and thanks, Tina. Um, who do we have next? Uh, next is Marcia Mosley from CBC. Go ahead. Are you there, Marcia? Marcia? This is okay. Mickey from I'm Canadian going... Press. I think you unmuted me instead because my mic suddenly got unmuted. Let me try this then. Go ahead now, Marcia. Ooh, not going to happen. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and we will try for um, Allison Bamford. Allison, go ahead. Hey, can you hear me? Mm hmm. Um, I'm just wondering, are we seeing like a, a greater challenges now with recruiting and moving appropriate staff um, just because of burnout and things like that in the fourth wave? Like, is it harder now to to find the appropriate people? So uh, I'll start with that, uh, <clears throat> Allison. The um, to keep in mind that with respect to the emergency order and the letter of understanding that was put back in place earlier this week, it allows us to create a labor pool in which we did throughout the other phases of the pandemic before the expiration of the original letter of understanding. Um, certainly, you know, we created a large labor pool with that ability to move people to where they were most needed and allowed us to match skill task alignment. Uh, we we are moving into a more significant phase of the pandemic, and one of those challenges that you face we face is not just fatigue and staff burnout, but also that our we we all we will be using some of the deployment staff to fill um, our everyday shifts, not just those over and above shifts. So we will not likely have as much flexibility as we've had in the past uh, to move staff and and to build capacity. But we are actively looking at that now. And trying to free up, we're we're confident with this next phase of sur surge planning that we'll be able to free up a number of resources to support the targets that we've set. But the issue that we're going to have is is again, it's not an issue for us with respect to equipment and you know PPE and and beds. It's it's a matter of finding the staff, and that is is going to continue to be a significant pressure on us as we move through this next phase of pandemic. Thanks, Scott. Ellison, did you have a second follow-up question? 
Um, yeah, I don't know if Susan was speaking to this already, but um, maybe Scott could also answer this. Um, you said like staff are being redeployed to like a lot of the problem areas. I guess where are the main um, areas that we're going to be seeing a lot of these physicians going? So just to clarify, it's not just physicians, but those skilled staff the, right now, um, although the, the the plan is is to to target staff into many of the areas of pressure, not just acute care, but our focus is acute care. So that's inpatient COVID care and ICU uh, COVID care and strengthening that and expanding capacity as quickly as we can, knowing that the case numbers that are coming in. Uh, that said, this, this component of surge planning will also deploy resources to immunization, contact tracing, and, and our testing where we're not currently meeting our targets, uh, but we will be deploying staff there as well. But the primary focus uh, is to try to get a, a large number of folks trained in acute care, uh, hospital-based care for inpatient COVID, as well as ICU. Derek, did you have anything to add? I think the only other thing I'll point out, Scott, is, um, and there was a question earlier about where are patients going as they're deployed or moved around the province and requiring critical care. And, and this is why this is a provincial response, is we need um, we need air, uh, all of our facilities um, to make changes and, and to slow down services in order to create capacity so that we are able to move patients um, uh, where, wherever they, they need to in order to create capacity where we are create, we are experiencing a high level of a fresh pressure and COVID demand. So um, I guess it's important to recognize that this is a, a provincial uh, approach and uh, and that it really um, supports uh, the, the movement of, of patients and the ability for the health system to respond to the demand that we're experiencing and that we're, we're anticipating. Thanks, Scott and Derek, and thanks, Allison, for the question. Uh, Linnell, who do we have next? Um. I'm going to call on Susan McNeil, but Susan, you have questions in the chat as well as your hand up. So I'm going to unmute your line and if you can't get through, I'll ask them on your behalf. Go ahead, Susan. Okay, do you hear me? Do you? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, my, uh, my first question may sort of have been answered already. I'm just wondering how hospitals in smaller communities are going to experience the slowdown or the reduction. They obviously have fewer services in the first place. Um, but how how can a small town, say Tisdale, Nipawin, Melfort, expect to see changes compared to Saskatoon or Prince Albert? Um, my second question is regarding the rapid tests. Are users going to pay that pay pay the cost of the test, or is this going to be something that is covered by the province? And my third question is. Um, do you have any numbers as far as how much younger the patients in the hospital or the ICU have gotten compared to previously when there wasn't as many vaccines or people vaccinated? Okay, so I'll, I'll start with the very first question, Susan, which was around how will the smaller facilities be used? And then I'll just ask Derek to, to follow up. Just to remind folks throughout the entire pandemic, as we talked about our offensive and defensive strategies, to address uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. We have always involved all of our facilities as a, as a single health authority. We, we look at our resources on a provincial basis. The role that smaller facilities play can be quite varied depending upon their size and staffing, including you know, the, the, the option to convert to a COVID facility or to use that facility to support the transfer of patients outside of bigger centers so that we can free up beds uh, for patients who actually are not requiring true hospital care. These are alternative level care patients so that we uh, move them uh, around the province, hopefully closer to home, uh, and put them in a smaller facility to free up beds and, and ensure patient flow and capacity in our larger centers where we need both ICU and acute care. And that includes you know, all five regional centers and the tertiary facilities in Saskatoon, Regina, PA. Um, Derek, did you want to go into a little more detail on that? But I, I mean, it, it's going to be dependent upon what we see um, with respect to response requirement and, and what we can do to move patients. But to Derek's earlier point in mind, you know, it is a system wide response. So we will use all the tools and capacity of the system to address our needs moving forward. And that means not every facility will be treated the same way. But Derek, did you have anything to add? I think uh, I think that one is good, Scott. I can just comment on the second question you asked about rapid tests. 
currently the SHA is offering a, uh, a test to protect program where organizations, businesses, institutions can access uh, antigen tests as well as support um, with uh, with education and training um, and tools to help them administer that within their organization. So that that is available and we do have a high uptake um, from um, organizations across the province um, as part of that program. With the announcement yesterday by the government of the introduction of broader access of, of, of rapid tests to the population, um, we are working with the Ministry of Health on what that uh, might look like and how the, the program might change and evolve um, as, as we move forward. And I guess just the last question I think was around um, ICU patients and, and how much younger um, how much younger have ICU patients gotten compared to the, the third wave? I'm, I'm not sure maybe um, Dr. Shaw would be able to answer that one. I don't have exact numbers for you right now. I have seen um, a, a bar charts and graphs showing clearly that as we've gone further into this pandemic, particularly in this wave, we are seeing younger patients. The reason why uh, primarily I think is because we've had such successful uptake of vaccine in our most vulnerable. So we know that as you look into our older age groups across Saskatchewan, uptake of first dose, second dose is very high. Uh, and sadly, as we go into the younger age groups, we're not seeing that those high uptakes. That means there's more people unprotected and the Delta variant just does not care uh, your, your age. They just care that you're back that you are not vaccinated in terms of uh, putting you at risk. So I uh, can tell you that the youngest person that I looked after personally last week was 21. And uh, most of my patients in the intensive care unit due to COVID last week were not elderly uh, and they certainly were not um, chronically unwell. They were unvaccinated. Okay, thank you for that. And uh, thanks to Susan for the question. Uh, Linnell, let's move to the next question. I have a written question. This one is from Devin Tassa. He's asking, I'm wondering what's happening to the Humboldt Hospital. I know previous plans had the Humboldt Hospital as a center to care for non-COVID-19 patients while other hospitals dealt with COVID-19 patients. Is that still the case? Derek, do you want to take that one? Yeah, um, I'll say early in our COVID response planning last spring, we developed a number of plans to deal with the surge in demand. Um, and that included the identification in some areas of COVID hospitals that might that might convert to be care to care solely for COVID patients. As things have evolved, um, it's been pretty rare that we've had to convert a hospital to um, care for only COVID, as we've been able to um, separate out patients on units uh, and provide safe um, care to them um, without without having to make that kind of conversion. So I would expect going forward that there it would be unlikely that we would be. Um, converting Humboldt, for as an example, to a, a COVID-only hospital, it would be more likely that they would accept COVID patients and care for them, and and we know we can do that safely and reduce risk of, of transmission. Thanks, Derek. Um, was there another question from Devin, or was that it? Uh, that was the only one from Devin. So okay. now we'll go to, uh, to Zach to say. Zach, go ahead. Hey there, folks. Can you hear me? Awesome. Uh, I have a question about the projection that was released today about ICU census. Um, as far as I know, it's the first time in the fourth wave of COVID-19 that we've released such a projection about where we may be headed in terms of critical care. I'm really struck by the story that Dr. Shaw told about um, the potential need for, for triage and your, 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 um, your references to that at the town hall last night, for example. Uh, so I'm, I want to keep this question fairly simple. Why is it that this is the first time that we are actually seeing any of that internal modeling of that projection um, released to the public? And why is it coming after a reporter at CBC already released it on Twitter? So I'm not. Can you clarify the last part of the question, Zach? Because I'm not sure. sure. The 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 uh, projection that you released today in a news release, um, I think it was Guy over at the CBC already tweeted out uh, internal documents that he had that showed that exact projection. Uh, whether that's a coincidence or not, I, I'd like to know why we haven't seen that internal modeling um, up to this point, given that it very clearly illustrates where we may be heading in this province. Okay. So so first of all. 
the internal modeling has been used all along um, throughout the pandemic to help Derek and the EOC and, and partner uh, IHICS across the province do planning for the pandemic. And that has always been the case. And with respect to the release of that data, we, we haven't been releasing it because it's planning data, it's not a crystal ball. Um, but as we get through this later phase, we've talked a lot about what's actually happening because I'll just remind you that in the beginning of the pandemic, we weren't using Saskatchewan based numbers to do those predictions. And there was some some pretty dramatic numbers that you know were questioned by everyone. But at the time, you know, going into the pandemic, we were depending on information coming out of Italy, Spain, and Germany. And throughout the pandemic, our modeling team has incorporated so many more factors with respect to what impacts um, the caseloads as we move forward. With respect to the information that Guy had received, that was not released um, officially by the SHI. That was leaked, and um, which is fine. <clears throat> but again, the, the reality is, is we are using these numbers. We are projecting based on what we're currently seeing for caseloads. Why are they so dramatic and why are they different than we've seen before? Well, while we know more about the virus, we know how contagious this is. If you look at the peak, um, today is is nowhere near the apex of that peak. The, the the case numbers today primarily come from northern Saskatchewan and Saskatoon, but we know rural Saskatchewan and Regina are, are, are about to join that curve. So that's why you're seeing the numbers for uh, case loads coming uh, at that level and height. Uh, our concerns today and into the future, because these cases are going to come at us regardless of what happens, because there's nothing that's going to slow them down. They're they're already occurring because of the lag. And that's why we're talking about building the capacity we have today to try to address um, the uh, not just the ICU census, but the inpatient census, which you'll also notice, Zach, is quite a bit higher than we've ever seen before as well. Thanks, Scott. Zach, did you have a follow-up question? Uh, I do, and it's regards to another leak, this one to me. Uh, I got some more of that internal modeling data yesterday, um, including projections for what goes on as, as late as December. According to the snippet of the modeling that I have, we could potentially, in our current situation with moderate public health measures, look to exceed 200 people in ICU sometime in November or December. Uh, it's the green line on, on the modeling graph if you happen to have it handy. Um, is that information that I have correct? And if we do go towards that point, if this is the information we're using to plan, what happens in phase three of search preparation? How do we get ourselves there? Okay, so just before we get into third wave or the 200 projections, Zach, just to remind you that in all of the projections, and I believe in the, and I don't have the graph you're looking at, but I, I am familiar with it. Every one of them has a lower confidence interval and an upper confidence interval, and those are wide. So even with respect to the planning and numbers that you've seen today in the news release for the 750 cases a day, that has a range of 500 to 1,000, which is not insignificant, as does the 200 max. So the other thing to consider <clears throat> about the modeling is these are numbers projected if nothing else changes. And those modeling projections were put in place assuming there were no other controls put in place. Yesterday, we had some significant controls announced. Last week, we had the contact tracing controls announced. Those will impact the projections. Uh, we know that from our experience that if you do things um, that control, uh, you know, the aggressive contact tracing, uh, increasing immunization rates, uh, which today are, you know, after yesterday's announcement, our immunization sites are all lined up. So that did actually send some form of message to the individuals that are unvaccinated. So there's a number of factors that will change that number. So that number is out there. That number is not insignificant, but it's not, you know, one that we're saying is for sure going to happen, Zach, because there's so many other things that have occurred in the last seven days and potentially more to come if, in fact, we don't see the, the caseload starting to decrease, you know, over the next four weeks. Just so I understand here, I, I, I want to make sure I'm understanding you correctly, Scott, because I think this is important. Um, in regards to the decision to not release this modeling to the public, am I hearing from you that you don't want to do this because you don't want to create alarm because you're worried it will be misinterpreted as a prediction? Is that what I'm hearing from you? What I'm telling you, Zach, is it doesn't get released because it's used for planning purposes. That is you know, we don't know that we're going to hit that number. And that number exists in the absence of controlling for any other intervention. So it is a number that we use to potentially predict what we could see 
based on what we know about the disease, its transmissibility, and the fact that it has, you know, it was a perfect wave. We hit the Delta variant and people stopped um, getting vaccinated. And then we've seen the cliff that we've created with the peak that's today. So what I'm saying, Zach, is the reason we don't release the number is because it's not a predictor of the future. It gives us an idea of what might occur if nothing else happens. Thanks, Scott, and thanks, Zach, for the questions. We just uh, we only have time for one more, and I believe um, Marcia. We skipped over her because we weren't able to uh, hear her. Uh, so, Marcia, did you have a question still? Marcia, I think your line is unmuted. We're ready for you. Uh, no worries, Amanda. I think she's having problems with her audio, so she has posed her questions. I'll just read them on her behalf. Great, thank you. Um, she has two. Okay, perfect. She has two here. Can you speak a little bit more about the level of triage that would be required throughout this stage? So I'll start, and then I'm going to pass it on to Susan, since she's our expert. And I just want to be clear that at the, at this stage. In the pandemic where we are today we have not formally activated triage but as i said before i believe yesterday or the day before in the in the media conference that does not mean that decisions aren't being made already today that have a direct impact on patient care so because of uh, the lack of availability for example of an icu bed we are seeing procedures can cancelled or sorry postponed uh, almost each and every day because we don't have an available ICU bed. And in fact, if that patient requires it post-surgical intervention, um, I'll let Susan expand a little bit on what, what the triage, um, the triage algorithm does, but just to be clear, we have not activated it this time formally, but that does not mean that there is not triage of cases or impacts on patients directly because of the current capacity in our system for caring for COVID patients. Thanks, Scott. So I'll just build on that. The critical care resource allocation framework is something that we had written and we discussed last spring uh, and through the summer because it was important. Uh, it remains important that we, we have a good plan and we have a consistent, transparent and accountable way to make difficult decisions if and when we get into the situation where we have more people who are sick than we actually have the ability to safely and effectively provide care for. Right now, the, the framework has been in place uh, in the background uh, since the spring of uh, 2021. Uh, we've never had to use it, uh, as Scott said, as a way of making decisions about who gets admitted to intensive care or not. But we are, because um, we're at, um, the framework actually has stage one, which is usual business. So I would say, um, yes, we aren't using it to make uh, admission and de admission decisions, but we uh, do because we're in usual business right now. If we get to the situation where we have more people who need critical care uh, resources and supports, which is primarily access to the nurses, the physicians, the therapists, um, the entire uh, um, highly highly trained team, supported by extenders and supported by colleagues that have come to help. If we get to that situation, uh, we would need to move into stage two, hopefully never, hopefully never into stage three and certainly never into stage four. But what it is, it's, it's an effective, it's evidence informed, it's been uh, reviewed and uh, with input from Human Rights Commission, it's publicly available. And really what it does is it uses criteria that are um, based on medical evidence and based on severity of chronic illness that looks at who's most likely to survive an intensive care unit admission. And if we ever get to the point of having to use it, um, referrals will be made, assessments will be made by the ICU physician, and then a conversation and a decision will, will be made with an ethics team that involves a second opinion by another critical care physician at another site, supported by an ethicist to be able to best make accountable, transparent, and, and the consistent decisions. I really hope that we never get to the point of needing to move to stage two or stage three or stage four, but it would be irresponsible to not have a framework. And I think it'd be irresponsible to not be talking about it and preparing people to be thinking about here are where we are. What you can do today 
to make sure that uh, we're, we're in the best situation possible is everybody needs to be vaccinated. Uh, this prevents as best as we know, as, and we know this to be true, it prevents severe illness and death in the vast majority of people who are vaccinated. The other thing is making sure that you and your family and your physician have a discussion about what your goals of care are, what your values are and what's important to you so that uh, should you ever need ICU, your family knows what you want and we can continue to provide care based on your values. Um, so that's, that's where we're at. Uh, like Scott said, we're not using it to make decisions about who gets admitted to intensive care or not at this point and our goal is to never need it, but I worry and I fear that we will. Thanks, Dr. Shaw. Uh, Linnell, was there one more follow up question from Mercia? And that's all the time we'll have after that. Yes, there's just one more, and it is specifically for, uh, for Susan. To Dr. Shaw, you have previously stated that we are one major accident away from sending the system over the brink. Can you speak a little bit more to this? Absolutely. Um, so, uh, we always aim to have surge capacity on a daily basis inside an ICU or inside a hospital. Uh, and we're, uh, we've proven in the past that we are able to do that um, in a very short period of time when we're in usual conditions. Right now, we are not in usual conditions. We have 50 patients in the intensive care unit with COVID. That is a 50 people who have, a, um, for the most part, a preventable disease. Uh, and without them, we would be in a very different place. Um, we also have, I think, uh, when I looked this morning, we had uh, 26 people with non COVID related illnesses and we had 5 available, available beds across the entire province. So, if something such as, um, Humboldt were to happen again, and I hope it never does, but if we had something like that, where we had, um, 16, 17, 18 people needing an intensive care unit bed in a hurry. I worry. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Uh, just want to end uh, by saying thank you again to Dr. Shaw, to Scott and Derek for making the time for this today. Um, and also thanks to our, uh, to our media members for joining us today as well and for all of your questions. Um, and that concludes the question and answer session for today and we will disconnect the call. Thanks again.